Hi, good evening, everyone, and good morning, Mem uh, Professor Mahmood Mamdani. It's such a pleasure to see all of you here. We're very excited by your presence today at the 10th lecture of the Distinguished Lecture Series organized by the Department of English, Jamia Milia Islamia. Today, we have the honor of hosting Professor Mahmood Mamdani, Herbert Lehman Professor of Government and Professor of Anthropology and of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies at Columbia University and Director of the McIlroy Institute of Social Research in Kampala who is here to deliver the much anticipated talk titled Neither Settler Nor Native, The Making and Unmaking of Permanent Minorities. We will be recording today's lecture and at the same time it is being live streamed for our registrants and subscribers on YouTube. There will be a question and answer session at the end of Professor Mandani's talk and all of you are kindly requested to post your questions in the chat box which will be then addressed to Professor Mamdani. This lecture series is being organized under the guidance of our head of the department, Professor Simi Malhotra. I request Simi ma'am to kindly deliver the welcome address and, and introduce Professor Mamdani to us. Professor Mahmoud Mamdani, our esteemed speaker this evening, and all others who've joined us from across time zones, I, on behalf of the Department of English at Jamia Millia Islamia, and our collaborating partner, Department of English and American Studies, University of Woodsburg, Germany, extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this Ministry of Education Spark supported Distinguished Lecture Series. Friends, we are delighted to welcome you to the 10th lecture of this series, which is part of the ongoing collaborative project we have on new terrains of consciousness, globalization, sensory environments, and local cultures of knowledge. We're indeed fortunate and lucky to have with us Professor Mahmoud Mamdani, one of the leading thinkers of our times as our speaker this evening. It is an honor and privilege for us to host Professor Mamdani, and we are all eagerly waiting to hear him speak on his latest work, Neither Settler Nor Native, The Making and Unmaking of Permanent Minorities. I'm indebted to you, Professor Mamdani, and I thank you profusely for so readily agreeing to be a part of our series, it's such a pleasure, it's such a privilege, and such an honor for us to get to host you. I extend a warm welcome to you and to all others who've joined us. And now it is my honor and privilege to introduce Professor Mamdani formally, though he needs no introduction whatsoever. Professor Mahmoud Mamdani is the Herbert Lehman Professor of Government and Professor of Anthropology, Political Science, and of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies at Columbia University. He is also the director of the Makarere Institute of Social Research in Kampala. He received his PhD from Harvard in 1974 and specializes in the study of colonial and post-colonial violence. His works explore the intersection between politics and culture, a comparative study of colonialism since 1452, the history of civil war and genocide in Africa, the Cold War and the War on Terror, the history and theory of human rights and the politics of knowledge production. Prior to joining Columbia, Professor Mamdani was a professor at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, Makerere University in Uganda, and the University of Cape Town. Some of Professor Mamdani's books include his most recent, Neither Settler Nor Native, The Making and Unmaking of Permanent Minorities, which is currently among the four finalists of the British Academy Award, which recognizes work that searches for truth and reason in difficult places and shines a light on connections and divisions that shape cultural identity worldwide. His earlier book, Citizen and Subject, Contemporary Africa and the Legacy of Late Colonialism, was awarded the Heskowitz Prize by the African Studies Association. Professor Mamdani is also the author of Saviors and Survivors, Darfur, Politics and the War on Terror, Good Muslim, Bad Muslim, America, the Cold War and the Roots of Terror, when Victims Become Killers, Colonialism, Nativism, and Genocide in Rwanda. He has received numerous awards and recognitions, most recent being listed by Prospect Magazine UK as fourth among top 50 thinkers globally for 2021. Professor Mandani, we are so grateful for, for, for your presence here. And it's such an honor and privilege for us to host you. And we're so looking forward to hearing you speak. Over to you, Professor Mandani. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Malhotra. Um, I want to thank the, the organizers of this conference, uh, some of whom I have seen on this screen, some who no doubt I haven't. Uh, organizers led by uh, Professor Malhotra, and I want to thank the institution 
Jamia Milia uh, for inviting me to give this talk. <coughs> Excuse me. I wish I could have visited Jamia, but that's not possible in this uh, seemingly never ending pandemic. Uh, but uh, taking advantage of, of the Zoom technology, which is certainly less arduous, requires no traveling. Uh, I'd like to provide an overview of my new book, Neither Settler Nor Native, The Making and Unmaking of Permanent Minorities. Neither Settler Nor Native is about the nation state and post-colonial modernity. The introduction opens with a history of the two phases of nation state, non-liberal and liberal. Unlike what is normally thought, I argue that the nation state was not born in the 17th century with the Treaty of Westphalia, but was born two centuries earlier in Iberia in 1492. Its agenda was summed up by a single slogan, one country, one people, one religion. This project set fire to relations between majority and minorities within the boundaries of the state, setting in motion processes of ethnic cleansing specifically of Jews and then of Muslims. This was followed by a century of religious wars in Europe. I identify this as the first, the non-liberal phase in the making of the nation state. <clears throat> the liberal solution to the religious wars was the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. Two key components of the modern state were born at Westphalia religious toleration at home, and the reciprocal guarantee of sovereignty abroad. It is John Locke who theorized the liberal solution in his Treaty on Tolerance, published in 1689. According to Locke, Catholics can be tolerated if they renounce any political support of the Pope <clears throat> or of any power outside England. This is how Locke formulated the key tenet of the liberal theory of the nation state. The liberal notion of the nation state turned majority and minority into permanent political identities. Only the majority has sovereignty. The minority must not participate in sovereignty. The notion of a sovereign majority alongside non-sovereign minorities was the original sin of liberal political theory. In neither settler nor native, I export, I explore the export of the notion of different kinds of citizens, sovereign and non-sovereign, from the US to South Africa and Nazi Germany, and finally to Israel. At the same time, the book explores the construction of an epistemological project that grounded the political distinction between sovereign and non-sovereign subjects in a legal distinction. Beginning with religious groups, this distinction was extended to a civilizational difference between races and tribes. I explore this development in some detail in the chapter on Sudan. Neither Settler nor Native is a book about the United States as a founding experience in modern colonialism. The first chapter explores the Indian reservation as the site where core institutions of modern colonialism were forged. It is also a book about extreme violence as a consequence of modern nation state building in the post colonies. Should we think of extreme violence as the consequence of a criminal project executed by individuals, no matter how numerous, along the lines of the criminal model popularized by Nuremberg, and today upheld by the ICC, International Criminal Court. Or should we think of extreme violence as a political project, a notion born of the transition from apartheid in South Africa? What can be learned from the failure of denazification and the relative success of post-apartheid South Africa? Finally, the book asks, what is transferable in the South African experience? What does South Africa have to teach us? To answer this question, the last chapter takes a fresh look, a look through South African lenses at Israel-Palestine, likely the most intractable political problem in today's world. Now in this talk, <clears throat> I'd like to comment on four issues. 
First, by taking the US as a case, I will compare the colonial conquest of Indians and the racial domination of Africans to distinguish between colonial conquest and racial domination as two different ways of subjugation, each with a radically different consequence. Second, I ask, what is the difference between an immigrant and a settler? Third, I suggest we think of two different ways of thinking of political identity, as political and changing, or as natural and unchanging. To historicize identity is to see it as born of a particular form of the state and therefore as changeable. But to see it as the ground for a natural and permanent claim is to think of identity as a timeless expression of a trans-historical and innate cultural self. In other words, I distinguish between cultural and political identity. Finally, I suggest that we decouple the nation and the state as we seek an alternative to the nation state. Let me begin with American Indians and African Americans. How shall we call the pre-Columbian resident communities of the Americas, as Indian or as native? What's in a name? Indian is the name Columbus gave peoples of the new world. Today, we consider native a more politically correct designation. Yet neither the US government nor the peoples they colonized accept this designation. The museum in Washington DC dedicated to pre-Columbian civilizations in the Americas is called the Museum of the American Indian. It's not called the Museum of the Native American. Why is it? that the 1964 Civil Rights Act did not apply to Indians in reservations, so that a separate Indian Civil Rights Act had to be passed in 1968. To be sure, the two acts are not the same. The 1964 Act is constitutionally binding, whereas the 1968 Indian Act is not. It's only advisory. Reservation Indians are not and never have been rights-bearing citizens of the United States in a constitutional sense. There were no reservations before the coming into being of the United States. The reservation was a creation of the United States. Though the reservation is geographically within the territory of the US, it's a polity separate from the US. The Europeans who came to America were not immigrants, they were settlers. What is the difference? Whether they seek equality or advantage, immigrants come to join existing polities. Settlers come to displace existing polities and establish their own exclusive sovereignty. Indian reservations are not part of the sovereign state we call the US. The term Indian tribal sovereignty, another politically correct phase, masks this reality of colonial domination. Legally, reservation Indians are wards of Congress. Reservation authorities are overseen by a vast federal bureaucracy known as the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The Bureau of Indian Affairs is no different from the colonial bureaucracy that governed any indirect rule colony, whether in Africa or in India. <clears throat> The Indian reservation was part of a two-state solution. The two-state solution, a sovereign state alongside a non-sovereign protectorate, was Lincoln's contribution in the second half of the 19th century. It claimed to provide a permanent solution for Indians who had survived the genocide. Germany also embraced a two-state solution after Nuremberg. Instead of reintegrating Jews as equal citizens in a single state, as part of a one state solution, post Holocaust Germany embraced the idea of a separate state for Jews. As a result, even if the Nazi project was defeated militarily, it survived politically. The two state solution gave the Nazi project a longer political lease. The latest version of the two state solution is in Israel Palestine. In contrast to South Africa, where the population was subordinated, majority of the population in Israel was expelled outside its boundaries. 
as it had been in the US when Indians were herded into reservations. America also originated the notion of differentiated citizenship with only some participating in sovereignty. Until 1921, Indians were nationals, but not citizens. After that, Indians had first to be purged as members of Indian polities before they could be naturalized as US citizens. Colonized Indians and African slaves represent two different colonial solutions. Both were turned into minorities, one inside the state, the other outside it. One was sustained by colonial conquest, the other by racial domination. The consequences have been radically different. Racial and colonial domination are not the same, even if racial discrimination is common to both. Reservation Indians have a different relationship to the US from that of African Americans. Colonization refers to conquest of territory. The American Indian symbolized land which has been stolen. The African slave embodied captive and coerced labor. The one state solution provided a political frame for the development of the struggle against Jim Crow and racial domination. Even if it succeeded by fits and starts, even receding, even if it proceeded by fits and starts, even receding at times, the one state framework both underlined the necessity of developing alliances and made it possible. The two state solution explains both the continued isolation of the reservation Indian through colonization and their ongoing fragmentation as a people. The radical difference in the political effect of each solution is clear from the American case. The one state solution has provided a political context for alliance building in a general emancipatory struggle. In contrast, a two-state solution has imposed isolation on an oppressed group by imposing on it a separate political home, a protectorate, and compounded that isolation with ongoing fragmentation in multiple reservations. I conclude that a one-state solution is politically preferable to a two-state solution. The American model was exported to a number of places, among these South Africa, Germany, and Israel. <clears throat> South African settlers attained state independence in 1910. A delegation visited North America, USA, and Canada two years later to study how Indians were governed. Three key elements of governance were imported to South Africa, homeland, traditional authority, and customary law. The starting fiction was that every tribe has from time immemorial lived in a territorially contained homeland. The fiction of a homeland in reality masked a program to expel each tribe from the bulk of its historical lands. Second, every homeland was said to have been administered by a traditional authority, also said to be from time immemorial, externally sanctioned by custom, this authority was said to be customary, not elected. Third, this traditional authority claimed the right to enforce a customary law on the homeland. Custom too was said to have been there from time immemorial. This time though, settlers insisted that custom be excised of all practices or notions that settlers considered repugnant to civilization. I will return to discussing the lessons of the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa after a discussion of Germany <clears throat> and Israel. <coughs> South Africa was not the only one that learned from the US. So did Nazi Germany and Hitler. Hitler drew two lessons from the US. The first was that genocide is doable and therefore thinkable. The second was that it's possible to create a second and a third class citizenship as of African-Americans, Indian citizens after 1921, later Puerto Ricans in the US. Hitler appointed a committee of lawyers to study American citizenship laws. This background preparation led to the drafting of Nuremberg laws. The learning process has been documented by James Q. Whitman of Yale University in his book, Hitler's American Model. 
I argued that post-war denazification failed because the allies shut their eyes to the political project that inspired and propelled Nazism. Nazism was a striving for a purified nation state, one that would go beyond distinguishing the national majority from national minorities to purifying the nation by expunging it of all minorities. After the Second World War, there was an American debate on Nazism. Was Germany liberated or occupied? Was Nazism a state project or a social project? Who should be held responsible for Nazism? the nation or the state, the Nazi leaders or the German people. <clears throat> the American consensus was that the responsibility for Nazism lay with the German people. At Nuremberg and after, millions were considered criminally culpable, culpable, though each one individually, yet Nazism was never probed as a political project. A similar debate unfolded inside Germany particularly among German left intellectuals, the most prominent being Franz Neumann and Herbert Marcuse. Neumann wrote Behemoth, a book that dissected national socialism. His answer, Nazism was neither just a state project nor just a project of German society. Nazism was rather a nation state project, a project of both the Nazi state and the nation, the folk to eradicate the presence of national minorities, Jews, Roma, and others from state territory. From this point of view, Nazism was above all a political project. Denazification would thus require an alliance of all anti-Nazi forces, external and internal, the allies in those sections of German society that had resisted Nazism. But Americans were unwilling to do so. Only the Soviets were willing in the East, but only temporarily and not after the Berlin uprising. I argue that Nuremberg failed to root out Nazism politically. To understand why I distinguish the criminal model, which understands violence as the result of an antisocial act of individual perpetrators from the political model which sees extreme violence as the result of group mobilization around the collective nation state project. Rather than individualize the violence as a standalone act, I point to cycles of violence sustained by groups mobilized as so many constituencies. Rather than catalog atrocities, so as to name, shame, and punish individual perpetrators, I seek to identify the issues around which constituencies were mobilized. More importantly, rather than exclude perpetrators from the political process, I seek to include them along with all those who survive, victims, perpetrators, beneficiaries, bystanders. I use the term survivor differently from how it was used after the Holocaust or after the Rwandan genocide, not just to refer to surviving victims of extreme violence, but to all who survived the catastrophe we know as extreme violence. The point is to try and stop the cycle of violence by shifting attention from perpetrators to the issues that drive the violence. <clears throat> I'll skip the section on Sudan. Uh, if anybody is interested, we can come back to it and I'll go straight to discuss Israel and the US. Are Jewish people in Israel settlers or immigrants? The Jewish population of Mandate Palestine belonged to three groups. First were those who had never left. They were among the natives of Palestine. Second were those who returned to the Holy Land on a pilgrimage seeking a religious homeland. They were content to be part of the existing polity. This group were known as the first Aliyah. They were immigrants. Then followed those in the second and third Aliyahs. They looked to create their own exclusive polity, a Jewish nation state in place of the existing polity. These are the settlers. The Zionist drew a lesson from Germany. Victims of the nation state project in Germany and in Europe, Zionists decided to set up a nation state in Eretz Israel. The Zionist state project unfolded in two phases. The first reduced Palestinians from a majority to a minority. This catastrophic expulsion is known as the Nakba. 
the Zionist project has continued to demonize the minority that remain within its territorial boundaries as a demographic threat whose numbers must be cut down. In other words, the Nakba continues. Palestinians inside Israel do not participate in sovereignty. They have rights, even political rights, including the right to vote, but they do not participate in power. This vision has become clearer as the state project has been redefined. From Israel as a Jewish and democratic state to Israel as a Jewish state. In this context, Palestinians face two options, a one state solution where they would face racial exclusion, including political marginalization, but within the same state. In contrast, the two state solution would create a protectorate and lead to indirect colonialism under Zionist rule. Neither settler nor native argues that a one state solution will provide a better framework for building alliances for a durable resistance. Second, I argue that resistance is not enough. One also needs the vision of a different future. I propose that we look at the South African transition from apartheid for a glimpse of a third alternative. Excuse me. A different vision emerged in South Africa in the 1970s. Before the 1970s, anti-apartheid politics was largely derivative. It uncritically embraced the architecture of apartheid. By doing so, the resistance reproduced that architecture. Each racial group organized separately as defined by apartheid power. Africans organized as ANC, African National Congress. Indians organized as Indian Congress of Natal. Coloreds as Colored People's Congress and whites as Congress of Democrats. Apartheid's ideological hold was not broken until the 1970s. The key initiative came from the student movement, white and black. The starting point was after black students under Biko left the liberal white student organization, formed their own separate body and went on to organize township dwellers, starting with Soweto. Radical white students left in the wilderness turned to organizing hostile workers on the fringes of these same townships. The turning point in anti-apartheid politics was not the armed struggle, but the strikes that began in Durban in 1973 and the uprising in Soweto in 1976. The Soweto uprising unfolded under the banner of black consciousness. Biko said, black is not a color if you're oppressed you are black. The important thing is to recognize that there was nothing inevitable about the impact of black consciousness on the anti-apartheid struggle. BC could have led to a nation state consciousness, claiming that South Africa is a black nation of the black majority, thus essentializing black as a trans historical identity. Instead, it led to an epistemological awakening the consciousness of black as a historical political identity. Afrikaners made a journey from being junior partners of British colonialism to being part of the anti-apartheid coalition. Even here, there was no consensus. The rift inside the Afrikaner community was demonstrated by the publication of a book authored by Rian Malan, the great grandson of a war state president. The book was called My Traitor's Heart. Milan was a crime reporter for the Johannesburg Star. His beat covered black townships. Each chapter of his book focused on a specific type of what was then called black on black violence. One chapter was devoted to the hammer man, a big black man who wielded a heavy hammer to smash the skull of his victims. All victims were equally black, but poor, poor people, who would yield small pittances. Milan's subtext was not difficult to decipher. If they can do this to their own people, what will they do to us if given half a chance? The South African moment was born in 70s and 80s. This birth was marked by a threefold shift in vision. From opposition to apartheid, they looked for an alternative to apartheid. 
Rather than being content with turning the world upside down, they dared to think of a different world. From a state of the majority, the national majority, the black majority, the resistance began looking to create a state of all the people. From opposition to whites, the resistance went on to oppose white power. I suggest we think of 1994 as marking the birth of a new political community. The alternative would have been to rupture the existing community into two separate ones. As in Sudan, one for victims, the other for perpetrators. One for blacks, the other for whites, requiring a partition of South Africa as of South Sudan. Let us not forget that in 1994, Afrikaners were divided about the future with a minority asking for a homeland where Afrikaners would have their own state. The anti-apartheid movement chose a different future, a common future for survivors of apartheid, who they often described as a rainbow. Not just victims who survived, but all who survived, whether victims, perpetrators, beneficiaries, or bystanders. The principal critique of 1994 is that there was no social justice. The critique both states a truism, the obvious, and misses the significance of the political rebirth that was 1994. I argue that we should see the rebirth as the beginning of political decolonization. The turning point was the reformulation of the central demand from black majority rule to non-racial rule. Rather than deny the existence of race as phenotypical difference, they refused to endow racial difference with a political significance. The first step to decolonizing the political was deracialization. The next step would be detribalization. Rather than deny the cultural significance of tribe as an ethnic group, detribalization would couple the link forged under colonialism between culture and territory, ethnicity and homeland. To do so would reverse the process whereby colonialism and anti-apartheid politicized culture through the creation of homelands, where a homeland authority would enforce a customary law. The result would be a single citizenship, not multiple citizenships based on separate identifications, race in the central state and tribe in the homelands. 1994 created formal political equality in South Africa, regardless of race, but it has yet to create formal political equality in the former homeland regardless of ethnic identity. My claim is that a successful struggle for social justice will need to cut across the political divide imposed by race and tribe. Without political equality, the mobilization for social justice will be fragmented into so many races and tribes. It will more likely lead to an internal civil war. The result will stink, like the 1994 genocide in Rwanda or its mini version, the ongoing xenophobic violence in South Africa. Now I come to Israel-Palestine. At the core of political Zionism is a political project to build not just a Jewish religious community in the Holy Land, but a Jewish state. Political Zionism seeks to erase the distinction between state and society. The conflation of society with state is the foundation of the nation state and its program of rule by a permanent national majority. The nation state may call itself a democracy as Israel does, but this majority is not actually determined through political contestation. Rather, the majority is defined pre-politically as in the nation. The most the majority can hope for is a democracy for the majority, but not for all. But even majoritarian democracy remains a difficult project in Israel because the state defines who can be a member of that majority. In other words, <clears throat> who is officially recognized as a Jew. If Israel is to be a state for Jews only, it must answer the question, who is a Jew? Its answer cannot avoid flattening the diversity of world Jewry into the Jewry sanctioned by the state. At the legal level, this question has bedeviled Israeli authorities since the law of return was passed in 1950. Is a Jew defined by religion or by ethnicity or both? The state of Israel now has two legal definitions of who is a Jew. 
the narrow definition provided by halacha law, which is religious law, which Israel enforces in the sphere of personal affairs, and the broad definition in the state law, amended law of return. At the political and social level, Judaization eliminates the unacceptable forms of Jewishness. The acceptable form is associated with Ashkenazim. Ashkenazim is the name for European Jews who trace their lineage to Yiddish speaking parts of Europe, mainly Eastern Europe. Ashkenazim were the founders of the state who claimed to be civilizers committed to bring other Jews into line with the national ideal. In particular, Ashkenazim have sought to civilize Mizrahim. The Mizrahim are Arab Jews. They present a special challenge to Zionism. For Zionism presumes that Arab and Jewish identity are both incompatible and indelibly hostile towards one another. Otherwise, there would be no need of a Jewish state in historic Palestine. Ashkenazi Israel has demanded of the Mizrahim that they denounce their Arab culture and embrace only their religion, Judaism. After several decades, the Mizrahim have paid back by standing behind the stark religious Zionism that has two targets, not only the Palestinians, but also the Ashkenazim, European Jews. In the Zionist worldview, Palestinians are Canaanites who never left home. They are squatters, not natives. The Zionist demand is that after the Holocaust, the squatter must make room for the returning native and get out of the way. The development of a Palestinian consciousness straddling these three groups has been an outcome of a protracted process whose focus and center of gravity have shifted radically over time. From exile to home and from an all or nothing demand for Israel's disintegration, to a demand for involvement in the Israeli political process. Organizationally, this has involved a threefold transition. At first, displaced Palestinians looked to Arab frontline states to be their protectors and liberators. After these Arab states were defeated in 1967, Palestinians turned to the nascent and exile-led PLO, an armed resistance movement. In 1982, Israel went to war in Lebanon. The brainchild of Ariel Sharon, then the defense minister, this was a total war against Palestinians. The IDF, Israeli Defense Force, deployed well over 120,000 troops for over 10 weeks. It was the country's largest mobilization since the 1973 war, according to Rashid Khalidi, the leading Palestinian historian. Outgunned and overwhelmed, the PLO withdrew to Tunis. Even if the PLO was defeated, Sharon's strategic objective remained unrealized. Instead, the war intended to suppress Palestinian nationalism only stoked it further. With the exiled armed resistance smashed, the moment was ripe for political mobilization at home. The first intifada in the late 1980s crystallized the internalization of Palestinian leadership and with it a definitive rejection of the failed armed resistance championed by the external leadership with a mainly refugee base. The second intifada beginning in 2000 brought together Palestinians in Israel and the occupied territories under a single movement. Both intifadas responded to the failings of the official Palestinian liberation movement. The second intifada in particular reflected frustration over the PLO's capitulation to Zionism at the Oslo Accords of 1993 and the onward rush of settlements that followed it. Arafat made two crucial compromises at Oslo. First, he tacitly accepted settlements in the West Bank. Second, he explicitly accepted Israel's stranglehold over the economy and sovereignty of the occupied territories, even going as far as to agree that this stranglehold would persist in a future Palestinian state. The success of the Second Intifada led to mobilization under Balad, National Democratic Alliance, a political party led at the time by Azmi Bishara, a Palestinian member of parliament, the Knesset. Bishara and Balad's contribution can be summed up in two bills he introduced in the Knesset, 
over the years. The first was a new basic law calling for collective rights and complete civic equality, but not political equality mm -hmm. of the minority and the majority. This first bill was still within the framework of a nation state politi politics, accepting the distinction between the majority nation and its minorities. The second bill went a step further. It asked the Knesset to affirm that Israel is a state of all its citizens. Whereas Bishara's first bill sought equal rights for the national minority, now he was asking that the Knesset explicitly reject the idea that Israel is a nation state, a state of the Jewish people, thereby negating the existence of both the national minority and the national majority. Over the past decade, Palestinian politics has moved from an engagement predominantly internal to one predominantly external. The internal engagement called for a state of all its citizens as a counter to the Zionist project for a Jewish state. The external management takes the form of an internal boycott of the Israeli state and society under BDS. To the extent that BDS calls for the de-Zionization of the state of Israel, there is reason to give it full and enthusiastic support. But to the extent that BDS seeks to extend this boycott to Israeli society and not just to its Zionist sectors, there is reason for caution. BDS needs to learn from the very experience it claims to build on. That is the South African divestment and boycott during apartheid. As a participant in the anti-apartheid boycott, I came to realize that its key mistake was to collapse state regime and society into a seamless whole. The main problem with blanket boycotts is that they embrace a mirror image of the nation state framework, which collapses state and society into one. By themselves, international boycotts are incomplete. The strategy of isolating the state internationally needs to be aligned with a domestic strategy to isolate the forces that stand behind the state project internally to drive a wedge between pro-state forces in civil society and those in civil society not aligned to the state. For Palestinians and Israelis, both those anti-Zionist and non-Zionist, the South African struggle offers two lessons. In Israel, as in South Africa, this means overcoming two categories of divisions. The first is the division among victims of the nation state. In South Africa, the population was divided among township dwellers and Bantustan residents, a barrier overcome by a coalition of students and workers. The victimized population was also divided racially and tribally. The racial barrier was overcome by black consciousness movement, while the tribal barrier remains. <clears throat> Excuse me. Among, among the Palestinians, there is a tripartite division of victims those living in the diaspora, the occupied territories, and Israel proper. Each of these groups has been further differentiated. The diaspora includes those in the refugee camps and those beyond. Residents of the occupied territories are split between the West Bank and Gaza. And oppressed citizens of Israel include Arabs, Jews, and Bedouin. Each micro group is subject to a different political regime designed to produce a specific and separate subjectivity. The second phase in South Africa led to winning over a sizable number of apartheid supporters to the anti-apartheid cause. That may be harder in Israel. <coughs> that said, we cannot forget that the ground shifted from under the apartheid state when Afrikaners, who provided most of the foot soldiers for apartheid's machinery of repression, opened up to an alternative to the apartheid order. The Afrikaner shift from the right of the political spectrum to its middle range shows that no political identity is permanent. What can BDS learn from the South African experience? First, whereas BDS can contribute to Israel's international isolation, Something else is needed if a non-Zionist alternative is to bloom in Israel itself. 
Like in South Africa, that something else is an epistemic revolution that will open the way to a political. The Palestinian moment will come when the resistance recognizes the complementarity of two seemingly different objectives, to unify the oppressed and to fragment their opposition so as to isolate the core opponents. The goal should be to arrive at an point whereby it is not just the oppressed who seek political change, but also many of the current supporters of Zionist power. Getting there will require a new kind of political consciousness within Israel. A consciousness based on a double recognition that there can be no military solution to the Palestine-Israel question. And that the flourishing of Jews and Jewish life does not require a Zionist state. <coughs> Apartheid fell because of a confluence of two developments. The better known of these is the anti-apartheid uprising in the township. The uprising brought diverse groups under a single umbrella. The result was not a victory, but a deadlock. Why then did the National Party choose to go to the negotiating table? To shift focus from a military to a political struggle? Because the NP realized that it was beginning to lose the support of important sections of the Boer intelligentsia, which were calling for a political solution to the problem of apartheid. The writing was on the wall. More and more of this intelligentsia were convinced that whites did not need to monopolize political power to have a home in South Africa. It is this lesson that needs to be driven home to Israelis, as many as possible, that Jews do not need to have a Jewish state to have a secure home in Israel-Palestine. Indeed, Jews are more secure in New York City than they are in Israel. The lesson for BDS is that they need to build on the gains made by Balad. To do so would be to provide a political home to anti-Zionist and even non-Zionist Jews in Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Mandani. It was such an enriching talk and there's so much for us to think about through your work. I mean, it's a work that one needs to engage with because not only does it you know, re make us rethink some of the categories that, that you've invoked in your work, but also it casts such a long shadow on our own times in some senses about, you know, how do we possibly think of a political alternative where one can actually decouple what you suggest uh, between the nation and the state, especially when we see uh, you know, a certain kind of a hyper-nationalism or an ultra-nationalism raising its ugly head all over the world uh, and even where we, where we are. Uh, Professor Mamdani, it was, you know, it's such an important talk. It's such an important work. It's such an important book. Uh, it's something that we all need to engage with, uh, you know, whichever discipline we come from, uh, because it will make us rethink so many things, uh, you know, not just about uh, politics, about culture, about colonialism, about, you know, violence, about, you know, political alternatives, about agency and activism. So, Professor Mandani, I have no words really to thank you with. I mean, it's 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 been it's been such a such a such a such a delight to really hear you and so much of food for thought for us to really uh, work with and and think through. So, thank you so much, Professor Mandani. And I won't stand between you and all the people who've been messaging all their questions to us. Uh, and of course, they're all directed towards you. So, I'm going to ask my dear friend and colleague uh, and uh, Susan Allianz to take over. May I, just, uh, may I just say one thing, which is that the, uh, first of all, thank you for those warm words. I know Indian hospitality is legendary, um, but now I've witnessed it on the screen. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I sure hope that we can actually have you in Jamia, Professor Mandani. I wish we were open when in August when you were here in India, but you know I'm sure there'll be an occasion sometime. So we, we really uh, want to be able to extend that hospitality in person and not just through Zoom. So I should say one more thing, which is that the book is actually available in India in an Indian edition, which is much, uh, uh, um, you know, not not as expensive as the American edition. I think yes, seven. Yes. Yes. Please, let's go ahead. With the... Yes, so I'll just take over. Thank you, Professor Malhotra. And thank you so much, Professor Mamdani. We have many questions and also many comments. Um, however, I think I'll uh, stick to the questions at the moment. Um, so I'll, I'll present the question to you, Professor Mamdani, and uh, you may respond. Um, the first question is from Dr. Atfar Shah. 
Um, and he writes, Professor Mamdani, thank you for such an enriching talk. I think besides the narratives of natives and settlers, there are emerging the culturally assimilated others who are well settled or annexed minorities, but being robbed of their cultural or religious identities, their languages banned in schools, their religious institutions taken as a threat to unity, thus bulldozed like China is doing in Tibet or Xinjiang in Inner Mongolia. Such nation state projects are actually the widely used tactics of forced assimilation into the dominant one culture. Why do nation states do this? Already we know such assimilative tactics were practiced by Soviet Russia by banning Ukrainian, Polish, Lithuanian in their schools. Similarly, England asserted control over Wales, Scotland, Ireland by banning schooling in those languages. Please enlighten us on how we should understand China's Uyghur assimilation amid no global approach. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you should have added to your examples of forced assimilation uh, the forced assimilation of Indians in the first phase where Indian children uh, were, were, were sent to schools uh, where they were basically stripped of their culture, language, everything. Um, then uh, the adoption of Indian children uh, in white homes so that their very identity and their very past uh, was, was erased. This is in the US, Australia, etc. But to this question of uh, China, I think you, we, we, not you, we need to put it in context. Uh, <clears throat> that entire zone in Asia, uh, from Iran to Afghanistan, to Pakistan, to India, to Myanmar, to China. That entire zone is today marching behind the beat of a drummer. And that drummer is the non-liberal nation state. Everywhere, the majority is determined not only to disenfranchise the minority politically, but to to, to liquidate anything which is distinctive about the identity of this minority anything which presents it as in some way culturally distinct. China is not an exception. It may be extreme in some ways, but what is happening in China is no different from what is happening among its neighbors right up to Iran. Afghanistan is also not an exception. I think we have to learn to look in the mirror a little more before we look past the mirror. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mamdani. Uh, the next question is from uh, Professor Amina Ansari. She says, thank you, Professor, for your informative presentation. Is the settler native dynamic in the American South of Panama Canal any different to the nation states you mentioned? Ah. Um, look, let me, let me begin by admitting my limitations. Uh, this book is not intended to be an encyclopedia. Uh, th this book is an argument. And as an argument, it's uh, thematic. And uh, the argument is illustrated with a number of cases. But I do not claim to answer every case. So I really do not have an answer for you about the Panama Canal because I haven't studied it. 
Um, so my apologies for that. Thank you, Professor. Uh, the next question is from Rachit Anand. Thank you for your talk, Professor Mamdani. The minority rule of Afrikaner over the black and colored majority in South Africa is an exception to other instances of colonization, such as Israel that you discuss. However, you argue that the overturning of power in South Africa in 1994 can be extended as a model to those places where the colonizer is the majority and not the minority. How do you propose that this contradiction can be overcome in such instances where the majority has historically held the position of the oppressor and not the oppressed? I think to answer your question, um, let's begin by looking at the US, not South Africa. Uh, I contrasted the situation of the American Indians with that of uh, African slaves in the US. The American Indians were set apart in separate, fragmented political communities each known as a reservation. At the outset, there were many. Over time, their numbers shrunk. This is what I call the two-state solution, which was really multiple states, the reservations. The African slaves were part of the American political community disenfranchised, rightless, but still part of that community. The two groups had very different futures. The American Indians, isolated and fragmented, have failed to make much of a headway. African-Americans in a single state present us with an example radically different from that of American Indians. Let's go into details. African Americans are today roughly 15% of the population of the US. That's their demographic significance but their political significance is very different. Ever since the Civil War, because African-Americans have been part of a single state, they've had the opportunity to build alliances. It's been a protracted journey, not always moving forward, zigzag. Two steps forward, one step back, if you use Lenin's language. Today, these 15% are at the forefront of political change in the US. Think of the Black Lives Matter movement. They have built around themselves a progressive constituency which speaks to the majority of Americans. It's not about demographic majority and minority. It's about whether the minority can translate its vision into a political perspective that can speak to everybody or that can speak to the vast majority. Amongst African slaves in the US, there was always a division between two kinds of perspectives. One said, back to Africa. <laughs> 
Let's go back to Africa. They even founded a state, Liberia, Sierra Leone. The other said, no, this is our home and here we fight for equal citizenship. Du Bois, Du Bois stood for equal citizenship. That tendency won out. But it continued. The political, the difference in political perspective continued. It was now not about back to Africa, but it was now about we organize ourselves. And the other said, no, we need to ally. Eventually, they found a way forward which combined the two. Not only black power, Malcolm X, but black power, organization of blacks is a step towards alliance building. There are many lessons to be learned. Palestinians were, of course, the majority in 1946. They've been made a minority. But it's not just about numbers. It's about the politics around which you organize the numbers and the fact that you speak not just to yourself, but to the wider political community. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mamdani. Um, could I take a couple more questions? Would that be all right with you or? Hey, totally all right. You've got me in a hostage situation now. <laughs> Make <laughs> the best use of it. <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll do that. So thank you very much. Uh, so the next question uh, is from uh, Tasneem Bharmal. Uh, she writes, sir, you talked about America, Israel, and Israel, Palestine, as well as South Africa. However, in the book, Good Muslim, Bad Muslim, you have written about modernity and its contradictory impact in the chapter, Islamic reformation and political Islam. So my question to you is that, what could be the future of Muslim identity in the world public sphere for their public private freedom? You're taking me back to another book that I wrote, uh, was it a decade ago? More than that. Um, but people are accountable for their actions, uh, no matter when they committed these. So the future of Muslim political identity. Well, I have no uh, crystal ball. Uh, to look into, but uh, but the future of Muslim, I think to, to, to get some sense of the future of Muslim political identity, uh, one has to look at the present um, and, and the ways in which Muslims are responding uh, to, to contemporary challenges. I think Egypt is a, is, a, is a good point at which to begin because uh, with the Arab Spring, uh, you had the ascendancy of a political tendency with Muslim brothers, uh, which argued, which, which was not in favor of an armed struggle which argued for, uh, for a parliamentary road, which argued that you could come to power through the popular vote. And this was in direct opposition to those who believed that you could only come to power through armed struggle. They came to power through popular vote. They were phenomenal in their opposition, but they'd been in opposition for decades and decades. 
and they had no idea how to govern. So instead of building, reaching out to different sections of the population and building alliances and isolating their adversaries, I won't say enemies, they began to speak to only their own constituency. And terrified the middle ground. Making them feel that if they remained in power, they were going to be about themselves only. And the middle ground shifted. And it went behind a military coup. I think another interesting example is uh, Afghanistan. The, uh, the present uh, confrontation you're seeing between uh, two political tendencies in Afghanistan, the, the Taliban and the Islamic State. I see it as a very, as, a, as an instructive uh, uh, development. Uh, again, between two different tendencies. One, the Taliban is talking about building a state. The Islamic State, in spite of its name, the Islamic State in this place, Islamic State in this place. So they, the Islamic State in any place is just a temporary phenomenon. They want to build a state that corresponds to the Ummah. In other words, they have international global aspirations. So these are two completely different visions. The Islamic State tactically is just interested in registering its presence through acts of terror. The Taliban is involved in an internal discussion since it wants to build a state and it has an immediate experience where it failed to build a state sort of like what had happened in Egypt with Muslim Brotherhood, where it had failed to build a state, it has an internal discussion on what are the limits of the alliances they can build. This is basically an ethnic movement at its core, a school movement a male Pashtun movement, if I might say so, but not just, I don't want to accentuate that too much. Um, so you have those tendencies in Muslim majority societies. You have other tendencies in Muslim minority societies. Because Islamic Muslim political thought has focused, I would say almost exclusively, has been driven by the presumption of the society being Muslim majority. It has devoted very little energy to where Muslims are a minority. And now Muslims are a minority in more and more states because of migration. As a minority, you have to confront issues which require some imagination for a majority to confront. 
a majority can sit comfortably in the thought that it will always be a majority. It may always be a cultural majority or a demographic majority, but it may not always be a political majority. So the minority is, minority has to face the challenge of how do you build alliances? It has to face a twin challenge. How do you deal with differences amongst yourselves first? And then how do you build alliances with sections of the majority? In my view, this is a key question. I'm afraid that's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. In fact, we had a couple of questions um, which align to the question that you've just left us with. Uh, may I move on to the next one, if that's okay with you? Um, this question is from Yash. And Yash writes, thank you so much, Professor Mamdani, for this sublime lecture. I was hoping you could comment upon the convergence between Ashish Nandi's idea of an intimate enemy and your work, Victim Become Killers, and how that problematizes the oppressor-oppressed binary or Schmidt's friend-enemy distinction as the basis for political. This is like an exam question. <laughs> I, <laughs> is, Ashish is a good friend of mine, <laughs> but <laughs> I think you should ask him the question. I, I gave him the book in, in August, so he's had enough time to read it. <laughs> and the last time I read An Intimate Enemy was, I don't know, it was ages ago. Um, so really, this is... I think I think you should ask this question to Professor Malhotra after this meeting is over, uh, and you and you meet her in class, or something. Uh, not to Ashish and not to myself. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question um, is in relation to India. The question is from Tanuja Sachdev, Professor Mamdani. How do you explain the situation in India? in terms of control and exploitation of the Adivasis, that is A, and B, minorities in India in contemporary politics? Well, I knew that the question would come on India. You can't talk to an Indian audience without attention returning to to India, fair enough. So look, I, I, uh, I teach a course called uh, the colonial state um, and the modern subject. No, the modern state and the colonial subject. So we spend uh, three weeks in that course. Uh, we did Gandhi's uh, uh, Hinswarat, and we read uh, Ambedkar's uh, two polemics against Gandhi, and we read Iqbal's uh, letters to Jinnah. Um, and uh, we read these in response to, first we deal with, uh, uh, we, we, we try and understand uh, the nature of uh, British colonial governance. So, in in trying to understand the nature of British colonial governance, I have uh, um, I've had a problem finding a single text which will address this uh, because. Uh, much of the recent work has sort of taken inspiration from Foucault, 
um, and Foucault's notion of governmentality. Uh, but without, uh, so like I re we read the uh, Kalpagam, rule, rule, rule by numbers, but so Foucauldian that none of this comes to terms with the fact that Foucault had nothing to say about the colonial situation. And, and was the colonial situation simply a place to which you could extend? Was it just another example of governmentality? I don't think so. Because the 19th century is a period in which in Europe, questions of religion, culture, etc., are being drawn into the private sphere. They're being removed from the public sphere and moved into the private sphere. Exactly the opposite is happening in the colonies. These questions are becoming the way to manage the public sphere. Customary law, starting with customary law, but then on and on with the Bengal partition, with the uh, uh, special uh, seats for Muslims, then special seats for Dalits and the Pune, Gandhi's Pune fight, and I would call it his victory at Pune um, against uh, Ambedkar. The British ruled India as three different India. Hindus, Muslims, Adivasis, Christian, Parsi, etc., smaller groups, but Hindus, Muslims, Adivasis. Hindus roughly 50%, Muslims roughly 30%, Adivasis roughly 20%. And the whole point was not to create a civil society by purging it, by depoliticizing culture, but to fragment the society by politicizing culture was exactly the opposite from what they did in at home. Indian writers think of customary law as a great triumph. They think of it as the domain that women defended from colonial imposition. I think of it as the opposite. I think of customary law, I distinguish between custom and customary law. Custom is a part of society. Customary law is a part of the state. What happens when custom becomes customary law? I think of it as becoming as, as weaponized, instrumentalized by the state. And how is it weaponized? How is it instrumentalized? So I think the Adivasi question, the minority question, the majority question, all these have to be taken together. I mean, not in one lump sum, but, but you can't deal with one without keeping the others in, in mind. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Were you going to add something? Did I interrupt? I hope not. No, I forgot that I was not in my class because I could have then gone on to talk for half an hour. Right. <laughs> so we have many more questions. I mean, it's completely up to you, uh, Professor Mamdani. Would you like to close or would you like to take one more? I can take one more. 
Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been so so gracious and kind to us. Uh, so the next question is from uh, Soham Adhikari. Uh, Soham writes, hello, professor. Thank you for this amazing talk. Uh, how exactly do you think we should deal with the phenomenon of visible invisibility that Professor Hotchberg talks about in her book, especially when dynamics of hypernationalism are at play and minorities become invisible in the public consciousness? Listen, I haven't read the book you mentioned. So visible invisibility is completely invisible to me. What, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I'm really sorry, but, but uh, uh, yes. since I haven't read the book, I cannot claim to, 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 to have an answer to your question. That's absolutely, that's absolutely fine. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mamdani. You've been so wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, I will hand over to Zara uh, for the vote of thanks now. Thank you again. Thank you, Susan. Good evening, everyone. This has been such an enlightening lecture and talk. And on the behalf of the Department of English and the organizing team, I would like to thank everyone who made this event so successful. First and foremost, a huge thank you to our speaker, Professor Mandani, who has been so kind to us by giving us so much to think about. We will no doubt be talking about today's discussion for quite some time into the future. Thank you for lending us so much of your time and for sharing your work with us. As always, thank you to our HOD, Professor Sini Malhotra, who is the leading force behind this lecture series in today's talk. Thank you to Suman, Shraddha, Susan, and everyone on the organizing team who are responsible for running our event so smoothly. And thank you to our audience, everyone who tuned in today from all sorts of time zones and places. Thank you so much, friends, and we hope to see you all again very soon. Well, thank you, and Zahra, Suman, Professor Malhotra. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Mamdari. It's ever so grateful, really, really. I mean, it was one of the most important talks, absolutely. Such a delight. Thank you so much, Professor Mamdari. Thank you. Please be well. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'm free to leave, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs>